Raised in a military family on bases throughout the United States and Japan, Jared Alexander spent his childhood playing war games and dreaming of serving in the armed forces like his mother, father, and stepfather. As soon as he was old enough and against his own father's wishes, he joined the Marines and was eager to fight when deployed to Iraq. The reality of combat quickly complicated his childhood quest for a personal war story. Jared's compelling and candid memoir, Volunteers, Growing Up in the Forever War, is an insider's account of life in the modern day military and offers thought-provoking reflections on masculinity, heroism, and patriotism. For today's conversation, Jared Alexander is joined by decorated veteran, renowned war correspondent, and National Book Award-nominated novelist, Elliot Ackerman. Both Jared and Elliot's books are available from our independent bookstore partner, Left Bank Books. Hi, I'm Elliot Ackerman, and I'm here with Jared Alexander to talk about his new book, Volunteers. So uh, first of all, huge congratulations on the book, Jared. Thanks, Elliot. I appreciate, appreciate that. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely. You know, I was wondering if we could kind of kick things off. Can you just talk to me a little bit about kind of how you came to write this book? Because I think you mentioned it was a long time in gestation. It, it was. I, I started, I, I laid down the first sentences, I guess, in about late 20, 2008, 2009, early 2009. And my initial intention was, I think, which is probably uh, familiar to a lot of veterans who have written anything, is, is that I wanted to write something like uh, If I Die in a Combat Zone by Tim O'Brien, something very, very narrow and, and just specific about the war itself. And um, I wrote, a, I wrote about a 40,000 word manuscript. It had about 40,000 words of problems. And then I shoved it in a drawer and, and forgot about it for about you know, six, seven, eight years. And then kind of went on to do other things and learn how to learn how to write effectively. And then kind of brought it back out and started looking at a few things. And I realized over time, over the process of reevaluating the work that what really needed to be in there was the, 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 the sort of growth into the Marine effectively, like how I became that thing it started out very small and then it grew in to dominate the work over time. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of war stories and a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, you know, pages on war itself. But I, I found that there was very few on how we got there and how we get there as individuals. Um, and I was having conversations with other veterans and other friends of mine who were all kind of saying similar things. You know, I was, I was motivated by, uh, novels and film and and just the way that we sort of portray soldiers in our culture and that's what pushed me into wanting to go to war even knowing that war was sort of was a, a deleterious event in human you know as a deleterious event in human behavior yeah. so that's kind of what that's what that was sort of the evolution of it and then in i laid down the first re, the rewrite of it i started laying down the first pages in summer of 2015 which is the the section of the the platoon the sort of fast-paced section of the platoon running into the firefight at the water tower mm -hmm. that was the very first section i wrote um i still had ideas of writing something about the marine corps specifically looking at the culture of it i referenced tells angels and the acknowledgement because that was what sort of helped me get some separation like well let's look at this like a, like a journalist might how would how would i do that how what kind of how would i portray the sort of animus that i felt and the kind of energy that was in that environment and so I wrote that. That was a, actually about a 10,000 word section. It got trimmed down to about four, I think. And then, uh, it, and then it kind of, then I started plugging in a lot of the childhood stuff and then kind of went from there. We'll talk a little bit about the title. I, I started thinking about the Volunteers of America, something a little longer. And then I, I landed on that. And then over the editorial process, it got truncated to just volunteers, which I think is a better way to go. A little bit. I really, yeah, I really, what it's worth, I really like the title a lot because I think it immediately um, gets to 
the heart of the book. And I think, I mean, listen, you know, you and I were both veterans of, of both the Marine Corps, but also the, you know, the Iraq war and the Afghan war. Um, and it gets to sort of, if you look at our wars, the one thing that in many respects, I think distinguishes them from other wars, at least other 20th, century wars and you know obviously the ones we've had in the 21st century is that they've been fought by volunteers and that makes right. them unique and i think that's something you get at very uh adeptly in this book particularly with the culture and the culture you were raised in i mean maybe could you talk a little bit about that i, I just had a conversation with with marine veteran john musgrave and he kind of went to his experiences of you know the you had two choices. You can get drafted in the army or make a decision about where you were going to serve. And that was, mm -hmm. you know, that was specific to his period. And then the obligatory nature of it was somewhat shackling, I think. But I, I had a, my experience was, was the antithesis of that. Like I was sort of dipped in the, in the culture. I, I grew up surrounded by fighter jets. I mean, I, I, it was, you heard it in the backdrop just as a natural part of, of childhood. I mean, I, I shot a an M60 at 12. You know, I was exposed to the, the way that our military functions, both in, in, in structurally, but also in a poetic truth, you know, like through the Persian Gulf War, especially like watching, you know, watching the planes drop bombs on television. And knowing that those are the same planes that were just flying over my base, not but, you know, six months before. I mean, it was remarkably, I think at the time it, it felt incredibly normal, but in retrospect, it was incredibly immersive. I mean, it just, you, you, I know you were just, you were just baked in it. And, and then as I got older and I got a little more intellectually curious about conflict, I started reading, you know, the, the narratives of Vietnam and, and, and World War II, especially, and a little bit of the Civil War. As I got older, it sort of broadened. And the stories of Vietnam, especially, were really motivating. Like they just, they did exactly the opposite as I think their intentions were, which is to steer me away from it. But I was just, you know, I remember, I remember reading the 13th Valley when I was 15 and, and, and just being blown away by that. Danny Egan and Lieutenant Brooks and Cherry and all those characters. And I, and I said, I want to be this guy. I need to figure out a way to do what they did, even if I know that the cause that, or maybe the, the politics of it were a little bit clunky. Some people have football stars as heroes. Well, I had, I had you know, uh, PFC Chris Taylor from Platoon. Right. You know, that was very much the, the guy. Those guys shoved me into the Marine Corps, quite frankly. I want to read something that you wrote in the book. Uh, that, that really stuck with me and I think gets to some of these themes and maybe you can, I have a question for you about it. Sure. You write in the book, despite the best efforts of all of those haunted authors and films, their work had shown me what I wanted to be when I was old enough. I could feel it out there somewhere. The draft that sucked so many of them into the armed forces and into Vietnam had been dead since the early 1970s replaced by advertisements and enlistment incentives, like college and job skills to fill the vacancy of an all volunteer military. But I would not need all that, I thought. I just needed freedom, the freedom to be old enough to march into the recruiting office and sign the papers and finally, finally, step into the world of rifles and airstrikes, ambushes and patrols and all that language. Um, there are lots of great parts in the book. That one, that one really, um, sticks with me because it's something I think about too. Uh, and I'd be interested in your views. You know, do you think it's possible to tell a anti-war story because so many of these, Oh, let me, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to reveal my own biases and then you let me know your biases and we, maybe we can talk about it. Cause I've wrestled with this a lot as, you know, can you tell an anti-war story? So films that you're referencing, like you talk about Chris Taylor and Platoon or F Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket or even books like the one I just referenced, Fields of Fire. You know, many of these, maybe less so Fields of Fire, but they're explicitly anti-war films. Uh, and if you talk to their creators, the creators will say these are, you know, we, I made this as a statement that is anti-war. And you know this being a Marine and I know it seems to, you know, we, I think we, I'll speak for myself, I very much imbibed those as, I don't want to go so far as saying pro-war, but there were things I looked at that got me excited and interested, and I felt just compelled by to go have this experience. When you watch Colonel Kilgore flying in an apocalypse now, you know, with the, with, with the Ride of the Valkyries playing, I mean, and you're 19, 20 years old. I mean, you know, you're, you know, as you know, you're, there's that great scene in Jarhead where everybody cheers, and I recognize right. that scene. So 
the place I've sort of landed in this is like, I actually don't think it's possible to, to tell a war story. I think you can actually just, all you can do is show a war story and people are going to kind of come out wherever they come out when you show them these things. But I'd, I'd be interested in, you know, in, in your views, I'm not saying how I look at it is, is the right way, it's just sort of where I've landed, but in how you wrestled with that in telling your own story. I agree with that. There, okay, I'll put it this way. There was only one book that came close to crowbarring me out of the military, and that was Johnny Got His Gun by Dalton Trumbo. Sure. And that was simply because of how dark and, and how rough that man's life became because of, of the, the war that he fought in. But everyone else from Leckie to uh, Gene Sledge to, uh, you know, um, well, we can go we can go and run a parade of authors whose works were trying to be anti-war and not a single one of them made a dent. In fact, they just encouraged it. And so I don't think there is a place for I don't think that there is a true place for anti-war story. We need to broadcast what war actually is. You know, and like you said, allow people to make the decisions. I think that if we show war honestly and openly, one, I think if we evaluate the motivations for war on a human level, on a, in a, on a clean palette, I think that it gives us the ability to examine why they, why people are interested in warfare. And once you start looking at that, then you can make a distinct, you can start making decisions about how do we kind of curtail this thing from occurring in our, in our behavior. Right. Um, but I don't know that, I don't know that art is, has been terribly successful at creating an anti-war narrative that has been successful in, in, a, in, a, in bringing about the end of conflict. Um, and I don't know that it ever will, <laughs> quite frankly. I think it's better to just demonstrate it as it is and allow people to make the decision about that. Yeah, and I, I certainly agree with that in so much as I've sort of always landed in this idea that um, being anti-war is like being anti-hurricane. I mean, whereas, <laughs> uh, right, whereas one is like a, a, a natural force, you know, a force of right. actual nature, war is a force of human nature. This thing lives within us and it will always continue to manifest. And the best that you can do is to understand it, try to predict it, and build your, you know, build your house on high ground. Um, but I would, but when I think that too, I've often wondered, and I'd be interested in your point of view on this, is do I think that because I, like you, am a volunteer? You know, if, how do you think being a volunteer uh, affects affects your view on these issues like do you think you would feel differently if your experiences in the war was were as a draftee and maybe the answer is no and i th i don't know and i don't know if if you know we're all victims of our own experience because i think sometimes i've come across the vietnam guys and they they viewed a little bit differently particularly those who were you know who were truly drafted right and yeah i think that that provides an emotional context that maybe is a little obfuscating like i think that if I was a if I was forced into a position where I had to fight in a conflict, I think my attitude would be to find something that's the anti to find the antithesis of that in my art. Like mm -hmm. let's push back against the forces that put me there, which is which could be political, ideological, whatever, what have you. And I think that to the other point you made about it being like very central to humanity, there's a there's a a, a quote in in the, the Face of War, Martha Gellhorn's collection mm -hmm. of, of correspondence. And she says, war is a disease. And I think that that was, I have a real struggle with that because that suggests that it's a pathogen that affects a host and then forces the host into carrying out odd behaviors that's destructive to itself. And I think that, that what that does is that provides a, maybe an intellectual cover. You know, like we can, we can wave away the subject because it was when we were not in, a, we were not in the right frame of mind. But I, I, I think it's exactly the opposite of that. We make the decisions to do these things. We right. made the decisions, you and I both made the decisions to volunteer to, to fight in conflicts. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I enlisted prior to 9-11. And as I kind of put, you know, made mention of the book, I was sort of waiting for the world to sort of line it up for me. And eventually it did, you know, in kind of the worst way. And so, I, yeah, I, I wrestle with that a lot. I think a lot about that. I think that the fact that I've, I asked to do that, I, th I think the fact that we asked to do that is the is where, the, where all of our attention and focus needs to be put. Like we asked to go to conflict, we asked to fight in wars and we asked to fight in wars that were kind of on a morally ambiguous ground to a certain extent, especially Iraq. Mm -hmm. And those, those we're, we're, we made concessions for that and still fought. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really worthy of exploration. I think it's because we've all, we're all sort of talking around the same thing. I think that I, 
you know, I, I think that you've done that. I know, you know, I've, I've spoken to Phil Cly about that and he's thinking along the same lines and Matt and a lot of other writers in this genre. And they're all sort of asking those questions. And I think it's really rad to see us kind of examining that one point. We mm -hmm. signed up to do this. We wanted to be shot at and we wanted to engage in that, engage with that experience. Sure. And in, and in many cases, kept, kept going back. You right. Know, very actively, even after we knew. And I think one of the things I enjoy in your book is you, in a way not a lot of other people have, have really broken down um, the sort of the bureaucratic pretzels you had to like, you know, hoops you had to jump through to, to go to Iraq, which I actually, I, I haven't written about it, but I, you know, I read when I was a young Lieutenant at one point and I was, I had yet to be assigned my infantry battalion. I had actually in a very obsessive compulsive way had charted out, I had figured out on my own, literally the schedule of every single infantry battalion's deployment mm -hmm. in the ring. I had sort of done it by deduction and by calling friends of mine. So I would knew which units were, were had the highest probabilities of going and then worked to talk my way into those units. Um, and I think for a lot of people, that's not, it's not intuitive, but oh. um, as, as you say, because the book is called Volunteers, I mean, it gets to the heart of what I think has in many respects made these, made these wars different. And I think there is something kind of unique, and I would even say melancholy when you get down to it, that there's all, you know, listen, there's a lot of heartache that gets attached to going to war. And there's something unique and melancholy about the idea that this is something that not only, you know, you chose, but for many of us, we, we kept choosing because we couldn't do otherwise. Um, and it's very difficult to say, no, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. It's also a memoir about family and you write about your own family. Um, and ultimately who, you know, who all served and, uh, in the air force and, um, there are different reactions to your decisions to go into the Marines. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. I, I think my, my mother and stepfather had long resigned themselves to the fact that I was not going to go into the air force. Mm -hmm. Like the minute I basically gave up that as a, as a concept, it, it, uh, I lost interest in it. Did they want you to go into the air force? Oh, sure. They, 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 you know, very quietly said, you know, we would prefer it if you got into the air force, but we're not going to like shove you in that direction. They were very Zen like about it. I think they understood my interests and they understood that my interests, I would, those interests would not have been fulfilled in the air force. So they were very conciliatory. My father was a little, was not, my father had a very, um, kind of a binary attitude or very prejudiced. He was very prejudiced about anything other than the air force. And yeah, we had a very, very hard conversation. And then later, in fact, right before I went to Paris Island, I, 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 we, I'd come to uh, Springfield, Virginia. He was living there at the time. And he took me, he had a, a friend who, or coworker, he was working at the tower at Reagan national. And one of his coworkers was a former Marine. And he had me sit down with the man to, and the man was his job there was to crowbar me out of the, as an example, like, you know, let me get this guy, let me get this veteran Marine veteran who hated it and have him tell my son all the terrible things you're going to do to him in the Marine Corps. And it fell flat on its face. I mean, it, it really just, you didn't even. I, I knew exactly how that story was going to land. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He didn't, didn't even, he was like, Hey man, congratulations. <laughs> It's like, funny you say that because I think, again, you know, to the book, you, you know, this idea of volunteers, um, I think another thing that is counterintuitive, and I don't know, maybe this was or was not your experience, but um, in many ways, you know, our generation, which is, um, I don't know if your folks were, were baby boomers or sort of of that age, my parents, my parents are right in the baby boomer slot um, and kind of children in the 1960s that's sort of the most like radical punk rock thing you could do was say, oh, I'm gonna go shave my head and become a Marine. Cause it was so in some respects counter to what they had done. And I would, um, you know, and reading the book a little bit, I mean, you write about sort of kind of, you know, your, some of the rebellious streaks that you had as a teenager and how, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but, but that, you know, this was sort of a way to like, to differentiate like, oh, I'm gonna go, I'm going to do this and it's sort of a, a little bit of a rebellion. And I think most people don't think or can't fathom how joining the Marine Corps could be considered an act of rebellion because they, those who are outside of looking at it as being such a conformist place, 
But I would just say in my own experience as a Marine, I certainly came across, it's actually one of the reasons I, I, I love the Marine Corps and love Marines, was you would come across these real characters mm-hmm. who in their own roundabout way had rebelled by going in the Marines. I kind of dropped the army and was sort of fishing a little bit. And then I, I, I stumbled. I had already kind of understood the Marines, but I just sort of forgot about them, I guess. And, right. But then all of a sudden they came up and they came up in my, my worldview a little bit. And I'm like, oh, this will fix everything. <laughs> and I told, I said, it was funny. It was really great because when I, when I went back and I, I met the, the, the it, was a, it was run by a retired um, Lieutenant Colonel Infantry Officer. Army, uh, army officer. And I told him, I said, I'm joining the Marine Corps. Oh, 0311 infantry rifleman. And, and of course that just disseminates to the class. And there was this, like all the, re- the reaction was beautiful because they were stunned and they were, you know, they immediately turned to the stereotypes, obviously you know, right. all that. And they sort of, you know, uh, badgering me with a lot of that, which I was fine with. And I was, but I, and I felt, I took immense pride out of that. Like, in fact, when I went into the Marine Corps and I graduated, I remember looking back at the, the, the roster of people who went into the military and there wasn't but a handful. I was the only one out of a class of maybe 200 something to enlist in the Marine Corps. And, I, and, it, and if, if you had known me at the time, I, I didn't represent like I didn't look the part. You know, right. I, I was I was I was a wily 155 pound mm-hmm. kid was, you know, read too much, quite frankly. And uh I did not look the part and I didn't, but I didn't also go in the Marine Corps to prove a point. It was just like, okay, well, the army's not doing what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. I need, I wanted to jump out of planes and carry a rifle with the airborne division or something like that. They're not giving me that. Well, fine. The Marine Corps certainly will. Yeah. They were more than happy to do it. And I'm grateful they did (laughs) quite frankly. I'm I'm grateful your book is coming out right now or is out right now because, um, because it, it really gestures to what is a, big issue in this country, particularly as you know, the war in Afghanistan ends is we're looking back and I think we can see like, there's this massive civil military divide that exists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like a chasm. Um, and, you know, I just be interested in your, in your thoughts on that, why you wanted to write about that. And I just think you, particularly given your story, your family story, your story of, of service too, I mean, just represents someone who has lived between those two worlds and can speak to that divide. And I'd just be interested in your ideas on what, what problems that that, that creates potentially. Oh boy, that's a big one. Um, I think that like the book ends effectively with me leaving. I mean, it does. It ends with me driving out of the front gate. It doesn't mm-hmm. really go into the experience, the post, the post military experience much. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was by design. And, and, because I think that that is, earns its own, or rather deserves its own own space. I'd say that I'll speak to my my own experience with that. I think that we've created a situation where the average American has no incentive to engage with the mm-hmm. war, and I think that what that does is it allows too much. Well, it, it opens up the door for, for exploitation. You know, uh, the military experience can be, or the, the, the military or the fact that it's, it's, a, it's not obligatory can be, that, that resource can be exploited in ways that are probably not beneficial to the country to a degree. You talk about PTSD. I, I, I kind of wonder if one of the bigger struggles we, we, we have or one of the larger a- a issues that relate to people leaving the military and, 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 and coming home effectively is that divide? There's no way to cross the barrier anymore. You know, it's it's once you, you you go from being a marine to being a veteran, you get siloed with one set of stereotypes, and then you drop right into another. There's no sense of normalcy in that. And the one thing I think a veteran needs is is, is to feel a, a sense of normal. I've I've come home. I have put my uniform away. I have left that and moved on with my life to a degree, as much as somebody can reasonably do so. Mm-hmm. And I think that as long as we end up with these kind of barriers and these sort of identity barriers as it relates to the military, there's never going to be a true kind of, there's never going to be a, a, a merging again of, of the civil and the military. There's always going to be that gap between there. My the perennial hope is that this reaches somebody who's not a Marine or right. who's not in the military, right? I think that's all of ours. And I, yep. we want to, we want to reach out and, and, and affect somebody who has no experience with this whatsoever. And, moves them to think about their world a little differently and about their, maybe even their politics. But that's become, I mean, that's a struggle. That is a big struggle. Um, mm-hmm. I don't even have a complete answer for you there, but. 
I mean, that's no, the listen, thing. I, that, that I, I, I agree. I mean, in my own work, people sometimes ask me, you know, who's your ideal reader? And I think sometimes the expectation is, oh, you know, that I'm trying to target veterans. And uh, it couldn't be further than the case. My, my nope. ideal reader is someone who is the least like me possible. And if they can pick up the book and find something in it that resonates with them, so that's a, that to me is very meaningful. Right. And, and, and the, the irony is there's a two entirely different books. I mean, those are, those are very like, if I'm writing for veterans, my subject and the way that I approach, it's going to be very different because you're going to know what we're going to have a common ground to work from. Right. So, right, I mean, right. my intention was to write this with the idea that, I mean, there's very few acronyms in it. I mean, there are very few, there's the terminology stripped down to nothing. I mean, I wanted to, I mean, well, I even you, avoid the language like warrior. Right. Well, the war comes in these flashes too, that I mm -hmm. think, is, is, is great in terms of how the, the, the book is laid out because as you know, so much of a war story isn't, even, isn't really about war. War itself is, I've always found it's actually, it's, it's actually a little bit boring to read about. It's very mechanical and back and forth that everything that's actually interesting about a war story is the stuff that's not going on in the war, it's the stuff that's going on around the war. At least that's right. what I always felt. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a, there's a lot of truth in the notion that one of the best ways to write a war story is to write around it. Tim O'Brien said in his uh, in his last book, um, which is that he said he, did, he never really felt like he actually writes about war. He writes about war so that he can write about other things. And yeah. He, he yeah. War as a, as a fulcrum. Um, but you write in your book, war stories are the bookends of the American story, which I really like. But I ask you this, do you think that this is distinctly American? Or do you think that that kind of, and I don't know the answer uh, myself, but it really made me think, or do you think that that kind of just comes out of what it means to have been be nationalist? You know, this, I, this classic idea that, um, you know, war makes the state and the state makes war. And it's this sort of righteous cycle as we have these nationalist states. But that really stuck with me. You know, war stories are the bookends of the American story. So I was just wondering if you could uh, elaborate on that a little bit. Well, I think it's, it's, I think war in the American narrative is inherently cyclical. A soldier fights the revolution and then has offspring. You go on to fight 1812, you go on to fight in the civil war. And there's this kind of generational yeah. hopscotch that goes on from one war to the next. In fact, as a kid, I did that one day. I sat down and I wrote out the years of all the conflicts and they're usually about four years long, roughly. And I started gauging the gaps. I'm like, okay, how long, what was the distance between World War II and say Korea last well, five years? And then there was this, as far as a major American commitment between Korea and Vietnam, there's about 12. And then it goes, okay, so I started seeing like, well, then Grenada, Grenada is about 10 years after the end of the Vietnam War. Like, and I started thinking, where do I land in that? Where do I land in that timeline? Um, to be somewhat predictive in a way. And, and but yeah, I, I, so that when I talk about war being the bookend of the story, I think I mean that both in a nationalistic sense, but also in a, in a, in a, in a lineage. You know, it's like we, 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 we keep creating the wars for our children to fight into a certain extent. Persian Gulf War being the sort of genesis of the Iraq War, you know, in my own case. Um, it's amazing to me that you said that, Jerry, because just as I confided and told you that when I was a young lieutenant, I very compulsively mapped out where every infantry battalion was going. When I was a kid, I did the exact same thing that you talked about in my brain. Like, wow, I guess if I this, there are cycles of this and seeing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's remarkable. And it's one of the, it's one of the things, um, you know, that I really enjoyed about your book. Anyone listening, like I would encourage you to pick up volunteers um, is that you you get at a lot of those themes, um, those memories and. Uh, and with a real clarity, kind of the, 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 the distinctions that differentiate this generation of volunteers from many of the others that have come before it. So uh, anyway, then I would just congratulate you. Uh, you. Look, it's, a, it's, it's a real achievement and uh, may it be read very widely for a very long time. Thank you, I appreciate that. And let me say it, cause it's the 10th, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Happy yeah. birthday today. <laughs> happy birthday, Brain. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for, for joining us today. And uh, thanks so much for your time, Jared. Thanks. Whether he would become another man dead in the street with a squad of Marines staring down at him was entirely irrelevant. Too far removed from the fear and anger and frustration that clouded my vision past the barrel of my rifle, the two men's in front of me, and the wailing of the young boy in the corner. 
When I was 10, I sat in a living room and watched America bomb Iraq for its Stone Age stupidity of its dictator and army. Now I was 25, and I was standing in the child's house with a gun pointed at his family. The end of one war had only been the genesis of the next.